So the textbook uses exactly the same example as the motivating example. So you've got this distillation column. But I want you to understand that when we are busy with the design process and when we just encounter something in the wild, um, a machine like a distillation column, the whole setup, does not have necessarily like written on it the things that we are trying to achieve. So, so most of the unit operations that we use as chemical engineers, they have a particular kind of purpose that you can, let's say you say, okay, distillation column's job is to separate things based on their thermal characteristics, right? But there's nothing in that representation that tells you whether the distillate is the more valuable product or the bottoms is the more valuable product, that tells you how many components there are, that tells you whether these things are hard or easy to separate, right? Like just by looking at that diagram, you can't see that. And so you need a way, there's no obvious way to connect variables to one another. And, and, and you may say, but that's wrong, Cole. There's, there, there are obvious ways. The first thing I'm going to do is I know that I can only manipulate things that have valves in the line. And so I'm going to look at where the valves are. Okay, now that's fine if you have an existing process. But understand that to build that existing process, somebody had to make this decision of where to put the valves. Right? And so you are kind of piggybacking on somebody else's analysis if you allow yourself to be guided by where the valves are. Okay, so I like to start here because there's a big question <clears throat> from the high level about where the valves should go, right? When you're doing open-ended design, in other words, something like you're doing next semester in your design course, you will find that when you design your plant in Aspen, say, and you drag all these icons, you'll have a distillation column icon, which does not come with valves. There will be no valves, probably, in the first cut of your simulation. You'll have everything, you'll have reactors, you'll have everything kind of hooked up together, and it will be completely wrong, because it will be, there will be things like two vessels at exactly the same pressure, but with flow between them. Right? Which obviously wouldn't happen. But which is fine if you're kind of saying, well, I'm doing it in Aspen, uh, you know, like there'll be flow. Remember, there can't be flow without pressure differences. But pressure differences of like a couple of pascals are finicky and they make your life difficult. So it's a lot easier just to assume they're all at high pressure and just live with it. Right? So, like, we'll assume, for instance, in many of your mass transfer calculations, for instance, you assumed that there was no pressure gradient across that column, right? How many of you, when you were doing CMO, were like, but wait a minute, like if that is true, those are contradictory things that you're telling me, right? Like you're saying simultaneously that the pressure in the column is the same on all the plates, from the bottom to the top, but miraculously there's vapor flowing from the bottom to the top. Right? How could that possibly, how could those two things possibly be true at the same time? Well, they can't be true at the same time. They are a, a useful fiction that we kind of just say, oh, you know, we'll, we'll assume that all of this is like same pressure, we'll assume CMO, and we'll, you know, so it's, it's kind of, we're making things wrong so that we can do the analysis right. And when we, when we start out and we've got a couple of extra units, you know, so let's say we've got another unit downstream, so maybe... Maybe this is actually coming from a reactor, remember, right? The, the, the classical kind of chemical engineering process says you've got stuff called raw products, you chuck them into a thing called a reactor, you take them out of the reactor and you separate out the valuable products and, you know, like you make money. Uh, and then obviously you recycle all the bad stuff, right? So we'll get back to that more... Uh, sophisticated example a little bit later, but I want you to really fix in your mind the idea that when you draw your first couple of diagrams, there will be lines, but there won't be any valves. And many of the assumptions will be literally contradictory, like the, like the assumption that two vessels are at the same pressure, but there's somehow a flow between them, or uh, energy balance is not 100% working out or whatever, okay? So you'll, you'll start there, and 
How do you make that first decision? How do you get from this blank uh, sheet to having manipulated variables? You have to mine your experience in this subject and the subject before about causal links. You have to ask yourself, what do I know about the cause and effect in this unit, and what do I know about the goals that the unit has? And so, the, the way that you think about goals is something like a list saying uh, high distillate purity. Yeah, those are high-level goals, right? So, so you have, uh, you want to make good product and you don't want to kill anybody. Okay, uh, those, are both good, those are both good goals. Um, the nothing blowing up is typically the first place that your mind starts going because you have to remind yourself, like draw in a couple of things here, remind yourself that Everything you know about the mass balance um, is probably a little bit the wrong way around. You have probably trained yourself to imagine that like, the mass balance is this kind of inviolable law of the world. Like, like the mass balance must hold. In must be equal to out. Right? Actually, it's your job as engineer to make that happen. Because Actually, it will happen eventually, but usually in ways that you don't like. Okay? So I've drawn in these little squiggly lines to, uh, to make it clear that these things, these things that up to now you have ignored in your analysis, are real things that exist. In other words, at the bottom of every distillation column, there is a thing called a sum. It's the bottom part of the distillation column. The, the kind of a, a, a big part of the bottom of the distillation column doesn't have plates. It's just a place for liquid to be. Right? So that the liquid at the bottom of the... And then you can, you can kind of think why that would be, because usually somewhere down here, somewhere down here there's a pump. This reboiler here, which is a thermosiphon reboiler, needs a certain amount of head on the input side to, to work. Right, so, so if there isn't liquid level here, like it doesn't actually work the way that you think. Okay, so there's, there's a liquid level over there. Then we've got this thing called the distillate receiver, which is responsible for buffering the liquid level from the condenser down back into these. Now, you've probably also grown used to not even really thinking about that. Many of the icons, if I were to ask you to just draw a distillation column icon, many of you would leave that part out. Again, because at steady state, it's not important, right? But it is important dynamically. So, nothing blowing up involves making sure that these levels remain constant all the time. And so, I have effectively a, a sub-goal here. So, you've got level control all the things with level, right? So if there's a level somewhere, it's probably got to be controlled. Uh, distillation columns, or that vessels that feed into pumps don't uh, go dry because pumps don't like pumping air if they are designed to pump liquid. And so you've got a whole lot of sub-goals that, that kind of goes around not killing anybody or not blowing things up. And many of those things are inventory control kind of problems, right? So you think about, okay, there's, there's got to be a lot of levels, and to control something, I need to measure it. I can't claim to have level control if I don't know what the level is. Okay? And so that gives rise to the idea that I probably would say, okay, well, so I, at least I need one of these, right? And at least I need another one of these over there if I want to possibly control those things. Okay? Now, the... The gas version 
of the liquid levels that I just drew, drew here is called pressure. Right? So pressure in a closed vessel is to level uh, in a uh, liquid level, uh, in an open vessel with gas and vapor or, and uh, liquid. Right? So if you have gas and vapor in a closed vessel, pressure is like the, the level there. Right? So it's the inventory. And again, if, and unfortunately, the vessel, the closed vessel version of like overflow in a liquid tank is an explosion. Well, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be violent, but it, it is a, a rupture of some kind. And so I, I, I probably want to at least measure the pressure inside of this column. Now, some of you may be saying, oh, well, but you just said the pressure isn't the same everywhere, right? That is absolutely true. And in most distillation columns, you will probably measure at the top and at the bottom. So uh, there'll probably be a pressure transmitter at the bottom as well. That's not on the textbook version of the diagram, but it's, it's probably going to be there, partly because some of these transmitters are there for diagnostics as well. So in other words, if I have a distillation column which isn't working properly, uh, one of the ways of not working properly is called flooding, and that can be detected by seeing the pressure drop rise over the column. Because it's not 100% obvious. I think uh, you've done the design process once, but like if, you, if you think about it, it becomes semi-obvious. If there's a certain amount of liquid on every tray, that liquid exerts that hy hydrostatic pressure at the bottom of the liquid, right? And so if I've got 10 centimeters of water on a, on a tray being held up by the pressure that's bubbling up through the, the holes in the tray, then the pressure below must be at least like that rho GH little amount, which means that if I've got 50 trays with 10 centimeters of water, I've got, what's that, five meters worth of, uh, uh, of water pressure that I'm holding up with the pressure at the bottom of the column. So, you know, so there's, there's a pressure drop, and if, there, if it's that much, it won't be that much because it's not, it's not usually that high, but... If you see very high pressures, that's a pretty good indication that there's like a lot of, there's a lot of liquid on the trays, which is probably not great. The opposite is also true. If uh, the column is dry, it's just like blowing through a straw. You know, like you, there's, there's not, if there's not actually liquid on the plates, on the other side, if the, if the plates are dry, you can see that again by the pressure drop. So that's a very useful diagnostic idea. But I want you to understand what I'm doing here. I'm thinking about the operation of the unit, not from a list of rules, but from understanding, like, how does this unit actually work? What are the things that are inside? But I'm trying to break it down a little bit so that it's easy to remember. You'll come across this idea later on in a process called hazards and operational analysis, or HAZOP. You haven't done this yet, but in the second semester, you will hopefully come back to me and say, oh yes, I remember that you said something about HAZOP when you did control analysis. It's the same idea. It's systemizing questions. And so if you think about the two goals that I've written down there, I've talked about an operational goal and I've talked about safety. And so those two big questions can be kind of sub-questioned. Sub so if I want to have safe oper operation, I need inventory control. If I need inventory control, that means level control and pressure control wherever, uh, wherever those things are applicable. Now, if I've got level for liquid, uh, if I've got level control for liquids, if I've got pressure control for gas, that's inventory, right? What other balances do we have? So we've got our, these are material balances, right? So, so level and pressure are the state in in the mass balance, right, for liquid and, and uh, vapor systems. We have other balances as well. And remember, I don't, blowing things up means violating one of the balances. That's, that's when we blow things up, right? We've now done material balances. What are the other things that could be dangerous if it accumulates in my system? Energy, right? And so... So we stick an energy meter into our system, right? 
What is that called? Temperature, right? So we need at some place to make sure that we are not uh, breaking anything re with regards to temperature. In many cases, I, I personally very much like having temperature, con or temperature transmitters here. In the, in the vapor line. That's also not shown, but um, I like the idea of knowing that uh, the vapor is coming back at a temperature that I, that I choose and that, that nothing is going wrong. In this place, the energy balance is much more important in reactors than in distillation columns. It's very unlikely because the Distillation columns don't generate a lot of heat by themselves, usually, right? And so it's unlikely if things go wrong and, like, stuff just gets out of hand, it's very unlikely that you're going to, like, look away for five minutes and suddenly your distillation column is just terribly hot. But it's very likely that that can happen in reactors, right? Especially with exothermic, react with exothermic reactions, if heat is generated in the process, then you always want to know that you're able to, to choke that back. Okay, so we've got pressure, we've got level. We haven't spoken about, so that, that's for safety, right? So the levels are there so that we can make sure that things don't blow up and things don't uh, spill on our shoes and mess up our pumps and that kind of stuff. It's just so that stuff keeps going the way that we want it to go. With only these, with only these uh, with measurements, we can operate the column in a safe way. And we can get to some kind of steady state. However, we will not know whether we are achieving our operational goal, which is to actually get product that we can sell. Now, to, to get product that we can sell, or to tell a customer, if you buy a can of beer, and you look on the can of beer, and you look everywhere, the bottom, at the top, everywhere, and there's no little thing that says 5% alcohol by volume. You'd be at least suspicious, uh, but you'd, you'd at least want to be able to plan your night, right? Um, so it's very important. Customers want to know what is in their product, right? From a different point of view, if you are trying to make money, you, it's in your interest to give exactly the amount of product that the client has asked for, but no more. And so if, if, if you are designing a process that gives you 95% product, 95% pure product, and you're operating the column in such a way so that you're giving 99% pure product, you are doing what the client has paid for a 95% product, but you've given him a 99% product. And so how do you know that that is happening? You have to measure it, of course. Now, we've spoken before about the idea that you don't necessarily have to measure that exact thing over there all the time, because analyses are typically expensive. So often, analyses are going to be so. So when I do that AT over there, I want you to understand that that is not a necessarily a continuously monitored uh, kind of thing, it may be something that is a proxy, it's more like a virtual analysis, right? So it's something that we can say, well, we want a way to be able to refer to the uh, analysis of that stream. Probably another option is that we could also connect it over there. Okay, so we've thought about what is reasonable to measure. And you can imagine that if we had an infinite budget, it would perhaps be nice to measure the temperature on every single tray so that we know that we're getting a good product profile. It would be nice to measure the analyses more frequently and at more places. It would be nice to have uh, different temp uh, pressure probes all over the column and so on and so on. You can always imagine that you have the sky's the limit if you want to add more uh, measurement instruments. Uh, what is the minimum that we have? We absolutely have to measure both of those levels, right? And we absolutely have to have some way of knowing whether we are doing a good job. It's either an analysis or an inferred analysis with 
let's say, infrequent updates from the lab. But you should always, like, you should never trust an inference forever. So there's a version of this, uh, of that same idea. So I, instead of doing that, I could put a temperature measurement up there and, and hope for the best. And say, well, you know, like, if I'm getting the pressure and temperature that I expect, probably it's working as I think. But it's, it's, um, it's usually the best to do this. So... We've covered the measurements, and that's kind of a relatively common scheme. I, 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 w I would say the most common ones are top pressure, that level, and that level. Those are almost universal uh, in distillation columns. That temperature measurement is less likely to be there. Uh, these analyses, it's very unlikely that you'll have both. And it's quite likely that you'll have some kind of inference instead of an analysis. But it's useful to have those analyses there. Um, in, it, definitely in the binary case, if you have a pretty good idea of what your feedstock is like, it's unlikely that you'll measure both the top and bottom uh, product compositions because you can infer it from mass balance. Uh, just remember that that is not true for multi-component uh, multi feeds. So even if you know exactly what the uh, incoming feed is, most of these analyses will not give you a full product spectrum. So, well, let's say it's much more expensive to get an analysis of a stream that says you've got this much of this, this much of this, this much of this, than to get a particular component's amount. And to say, oh, yes, well, you have so much of this in some other component. So it's much, more, it's much easier and cheaper to build single component detectors than to build full analysis. So the next step is we figured out what we're trying to do. Because we're trying to do those things, we've figured out what we need to measure. That's the most important thing, right? Because measuring is the key to control. But, of course, it's all useless if it's like the way I've drawn it here, if there are no valves we just have to sit back and watch, right? At, at least now, we can sit back and watch and know that we're doing it wrong, right? But right now, as I've drawn it, we have no way of making it better. So the next step is figuring out where possibly could I put valves. Now, again, you have the option, at least conceptually, to put a, a valve in every line that carries a fluid in, the, in this diagram. So you could theoretically put a valve in this vapor line. You could put another valve over there. You could put another valve over there. You could put two valves on either side of that split, right? You could put a valve over there. You could put a valve over there, a valve over there, a valve over here. And then in the cooling line over here, you could put valves as well. So, so I mean, there's a lot of possibilities because a valve is just about changing the flow rate of something, or at least the pressure drop that influences the flow rate. But there are some guidelines about what things are easy to manipulate and what things are hard to manipulate. Okay? When we're talking flow, it is significantly easier and more reliable to manipulate the flow rate of a liquid than to manipulate the flow rate of a gas. So you may recall from, from uh, your uh, piping design and, and just from kind of common sense as a chemical engineer that for the same flow rates, a vapor occupies in the order of magnitude, three orders of magnitude more space than the equivalent liquid. So if I condense something, you know, that, that, so if you think about the density of water versus the density of steam, it's a roughly thousand-fold change, right? And so... Pipes carrying vapors uh, are typically much bigger than pipes carrying the equivalent mass flow rate of liquid, right? And so you're much better off if all the equipment is smaller if you manipulate on the liquid side than if you manipulate on the gas side, okay? So that's, that's the one kind of key thing. So that's the heuristic that I'm using to tell me there's almost no chance that I will manipulate this thing over here. Now, again, if you think about a factor of a thousand, um, now, again, it's, you, the, the vapor lines won't be a thousand times bigger, right? They'll be 
probably about 100 times bigger in cross-sectional area. Why? Because the kind of linear velocities that you think about when you're designing for flow is about 10 times higher for gas. You, you remember those heuristics, right, from piping design, where for linear velocities in liquid lines, it's like 4 meters per second-ish, right? It's like single-digit meters per second. For, uh, for vapors, it was double-digit meters per second. Okay, so you've got a factor of 10 there, so you're taking a factor of 10 down on the volume, going from 1,000 to 100, and what's important is the surface area, because you'll remember that the uh, kind of linear velocity and the surface area, you multiply them, you get the volumetric flow rate. All right, and so for the same, so, but, but that tells you that vapor lines are like this, and liquid lines are like this. Literally, I mean, that's a roughly, that's roughly the kind of, size difference. If you just condense all that vapor going through that pipe, uh, you'll get it down to that kind of volume. If you're designing with roughly the same kind of heuristics uh, that you have in mind. And so that means instead of buying a massive valve like this, or like a big butterfly valve that you have to put into a vapor line, you can buy a small little globe valve and put it in one of these liquid lines. Um, also remember, so, okay, so definitely I'm not going to put a valve, so these are red. All the colors are working, that's beautiful. Okay, so uh, no valve over there, okay, probably, probably not a valve over there. Um, similarly, probably no valves over here. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of tell you a little bit more about that, so the top cross there I don't have a valve in the vapor return because of the vapor argument, because like there's a liquid there and I could manipulate that. Um, this, particular, this particular kind of uh, boiler is called a thermosiphon boiler. It works on very, very small pressure differences, right? So the way, so you, can, you guys have come across a, pre, a thermosiphon before. Um, this liquid what, what's happening here is I'm, I'm using steam to boil that liquid, and it's the density difference between there and there that actually drives the flow. So it's just the fact that the vapor is so much less dense. So as I boil it, new liquid comes up, but you can imagine that there's not that much room, there's not that much difference or head there. And so if I were to put a line or a valve in that line, I wouldn't have much pressure drop over that valve. And so that's the second heuristic, is that in most cases you're looking for manipulations. If you're trying to put a valve in, you're putting a valve in in a place where there's a lot of pressure to, to dump. Right? Remember, valve's jobs, a valve's job is to get rid of energy in a, in a stream, if you think about it. Right? So there's pressure above the valve, and that valve's job is like to get rid of that pressure. And remember you think maybe about pressure, but like the pressure, the, uh, the uh, equations that you use to design pipes, even though there were heads everywhere, that was actually an energy balance. Do you remember? It wasn't, the mass balance, it wasn't the mass balance that told you how much pressure would fall, it was the energy balance. So valves are like a way of, of kind of effectively extracting energy from, from the system. Okay? And there's not that much of it in that position. Okay. Um, the I'm going to also I'm going to introduce a change here because I can tell you there's zero chance that it is the way that it's drawn in the book. Uh, the way that it's drawn in the book is just with the valve over here, like in that output line. I'm drawing it there because 100% guaranteed there's one of these before one of those for the same argument that I just made. So. Um, and now you can say, but I, Carl, why didn't we just put one of those in the bottoms that was going to there? But because uh, if I put it in that place, I'm losing all the benefit of putting in a thermosiphon reboiler in the first place. I'm using a thermosiphon reboiler in order to not have a pump. If I, if I was using something like a kettle reboiler or some other kind of reboiler, I would obviously have a pump there. I would have a pump to get the liquid into the, into the boiler. Okay, so definitely I have a pump over there, and 100% guaranteed the valve is in the delivery line of the pump, not in the suction line of the pump. Right? 
Valves in suction lines are very bad. And they will, they will uh, gain you immediate demerits in my, uh, in my uh, evaluation of your control later on. Now we've got obvious control here and here. And to a certain extent, it doesn't really matter on what side that is. So I definitely need a handle on my cooling water, and I definitely need a handle on my... So basically, as a general rule, you'll always want a handle on your utility flow rates. Okay? And so the last thing that I want to know is whether I should put a valve in these lines. And it turns out that I actually need a valve in both of them. Now, I know this, and I will explain it all in more detail tomorrow, but I wanted, I wanted to spend the time developing this diagram. The, the book kind of just jumps in with these choices already made, making it seem like it's the only version. I wanted you to understand that there's work. This, look at this. Make sure that you understand how to get to this point. We'll be talking about this in more detail in the next theme, but I wanted to prime your brain so that you're kind of in the place where uh, you are ready to think about this because the calculation attached to this, the RGA, it seems like magic, but you should always check it with your gut. Yesterday, we came as far as um, thinking about the original idea of I have a column, but at this point in time, at the design time, there are no control valves yet, and there are no uh, measurements yet. And what we started with yesterday is, is reasoning through how would we determine what we would like to measure and what handles we conceivably could attach to those measurements. But we haven't really spoken about connecting a handle to a uh, variable. And so you'll hear me say handle here um, as a slightly more generic uh, word, which you can basically map down to valve. But, you know, it, it, it's, I need some kind of a control variable, a final control element, to affect the things that I'm trying to control. And so we went through the whole process, which went basically through uh, trying to figure out what the goals are and the goals inform the measurements, right? So when you have goals, you want to be able to know whether you've achieved those goals. And so you work from the goals to understanding which measurements you would use in order to verify that you've achieved those goals. And then you figure out what handles, what controlled variables you possibly could use in order to affect those variables. And so sometimes it's as easy as just reasoning through what flows they are, or what things they are. In some cases, uh, and we'll speak more about this a little bit later, but in some cases, it may be that you, uh, that you have some kind of target for this temperature, but you don't actually have a heat exchanger in there yet. And so some of the control reasoning also involves adding equipment in some cases. Okay, but so now we've got the problem mapped out. And now we just have this one problem left, which is, I know what the measurements are. I know that I've put in some handles that affect those measurements, but I have a problem. The measurements are affected by more than one of these valves. So, for instance, if I change the reflux rate in this distillation column, I will have a cascade of effects throughout the operation. So if I keep all the valves at the same position, but I change that one, what will happen? This level will start to drop, right? A little bit later, so that, that will kind of happen first. A little bit later, um, the separation profile in the column will change in such a way so that I'll get better separation. That's typically what happens if I increase the amount of reflux, I'll start uh, getting better separation because I've got more liquid on the trays and so on and so on, right? Um, but if I keep all of the stuff at the same place, this is not a stable move. If I just open that valve, eventually, Things will, things will go wrong because this tank will inevitably, given that I started at a nice steady state, if I just open that one valve, right, then this tank will start emptying out. And if I were an operator, if I were looking at this on a, on a graph, or even if I were just operating this 
Uh, I think all of you operated, or at least saw people operate the big distillation column during CLB last year. Is that accurate? Most of you at least. So you understand that this is kind of, these are all these different variables, and you have to watch and say, okay, so I've opened the reflux, and so now I'm, I, I notice, after having opened the reflux, I notice that that level seems to be dropping, so I'm going to also close this valve a little bit so that that uh, level doesn't drop as much. You know, so you've got a lot of different options. I could open this valve to get more distillate, but then I would have to close this valve to keep the level the same. Or I have other options. I could also just increase the boil up rate. So I could boil up more and a little bit slower, but boiling up more will cause more vapor to come over the top, which will cause the tank to fill up from the top. And so we immediately see that we've got multiple ways of achieving exactly the same goals. If, if my goal was increase the concentration at the top of the column and keep all the other stuff as constant as you can, I have lots of different ways to do that. Okay? Uh, or let's say I have lots of different ways to think about that, but there's in most cases practically only one configuration that, will, that this new configuration or this new position will involve more boiler more reflux, and less distillate. Like, if, if I want to just think about what I have to do, what do I have to do to get to a higher purity separation? I need to add more energy. I need to increase the reflux ratio, which inevitably means through a mass... Does that kind of resonate with everybody? Now, that's the reasoning that I'm doing with my brain as a person. How do we approximate that behavior? By a control system. We have lots of different options, right? So we can say, let's put a controller, let's connect this analysis over here. So like one option is to say, we'll, we'll connect that controller or that uh, transmitter to a controller over here, and that controller will be connected to that valve. Um, and I can, I can connect that level control to that valve. So that's one, right? Uh, another option is to do it the other way around, right? So I can say I'm going to use the reflux to control the level, and I'm going to use the distillate to control the analysis. Both of those are valid connections. So how do I know which one to choose? The first way that I can know is to reason about it heuristically. And this is, let me be very honest, the way that most of these decisions are made. The heuristics are discussed early on. They're the same heuristics that we were using for SISO loops, where you're trying to couple manipulated variables to controlled variables, where the manipulated variable has a large effect on the controlled variable. It has a... Uh, let's say, large and repeatably large, right? So large over the ex entire extent of, extent of operation. It has as little effect as possible on any other variable. Because obviously, if, you, if you're if changing a handle and a lot of things are changing at the same time, that just maybe is going to make your control task harder. So you're trying to, to find something that's like a one-to-one -one connection, right? Um, and so that's the gain. Now, if you think about large effect, large effect, you should be thinking gain, right? So, so we're thinking about if I were to calculate all the gains from each one of these variables, so I can say, okay, if I move this valve, how much does that change, right? If I move this valve, how much does that change? If I move this valve, how much does that change? Eventually, right? That's magnitude of effect, that's gain. The other thing that you want to do is you want to have as little as possible time. So there's dynamics also. So there's gain. Eventually, the effect must be large. But also, the effect must be as immediate as possible. OK? So you, you typically would choose one of these valves if you were really concerned about that level. One of these valves is probably better, a better way to control that level than the boiler. They will all have an effect, right? So these will have an immediate effect. This valve will have an eventual effect through the boiler, through the condensate, all the way down into the drum. And so all three of those variables affect the drum level. How do I choose? With the heuristics of gain and time. 
if I'm just doing it with like thinking, no calculations. But it is possible to do better if I'm just focusing on the gain. Now I must also say, I'm going to show you how to do the RGA calculation. The part about the RGA in the textbook is quite involved in the sense that the calculation is quite, uh, it's, it's hard if you do it by hand, and it's especially hard if you do it by hand um, for large matrices. Uh, I prefer the matrix-oriented version of the calculation because it scales quite well. You can use it for any size. Um, it is useful. Uh, not. Uh, it is useful to know that the RGA calculation is a calculation that is about gain only, in the way that the textbook talks about it. There's a little bit about dynamic RGA. I'm never going to want you to do dynamic RGA. I'm only ever going to want you to do steady-state RGA, and so. It's fine in this subject for you to imagine that the RGA is about gain only. That means two things. It means you have a little bit less studying to do when you think about how to calculate it. But it also means that you have to understand that the dynamics will only be captured by the heuristics in your brain. So if you have a decision to make between two equivalent gain situations, you should use the dynamics as the tiebreaker. You should use the faster one above the slower one. Does that make sense? Now, I said that we have to think about the gain. We have to think about how large is the effect. But the key insight of the RGA is that what we really should be thinking about is not just the magnitude of the effect open loop in isolation, but we should be thinking about what happens when the other controllers that are all trying to control their variables go from doing a good job at control, in other words, where they keep Y constant, to doing manual control, in other words, where they keep U constant. And the definition of the RGA, if you look at the formula that's on the screen over here, this is the definition that I want you to internalize. Right? That's the definition. The way to calculate it, that's not the definition. Right? This is what the RGA represents. The elements of the RGA represent the ratio of the gain of a system. Now, you can see here, this is the U and Y here are U being inputs, as we've become accustomed to, and Y being outputs of the system, right? The numerator is with U being held constant. Now, this is called the open loop gain, and what this means is this is when the other controllers are in manual. In other words, they are keeping their outputs constant. Right? Remember, the controller outputs are the system inputs. The closed loop gain is the same gain. It's the, it's the change of the output of the system, given change of an input of the system. But here it is with the other controllers working correctly. In other words, when a controller is working correctly, it is keeping it's Y constant. Does that make sense? And so this is what this gain ratio represents. We've got the gain of this particular element, right? Given that the other controllers are, are, are off, effectively, they're on, man, uh, they're on manual, keeping their outputs, keeping U constant, divided by the gain when they are working correctly as controllers, in other words, keeping Y constant. Now, you can do this. Uh, you can go and actually calculate this with all the partial derivatives given a process model. You can also do this by steps, but it's significantly easier if you've already done the work. If you have a transfer function model of your system, you have a very easy way of calculating the gain, the straight gain of the system. Now, I want to make it clear, the straight gain of the system is, is not the same as this, because this is that ratio. We're going to calculate that ratio uh, by... And I, I've, I've written this notebook keeping, into, uh, keeping in mind that uh, it's useful to have it in a form where you can just like plug in the values that you have. So I, I've, I've written it relatively generally. But basically, if I have a transfer function model, I can calculate the gain matrix of that transfer function model by taking the limit as s goes to 0. This is, this is that kind of specialized version of the... Uh, final value theorem that we've spoken about before. Um, the old version of this notebook went through a little bit more 
procedure because the new version of SymPy now does allow you to take limits on matrices. So every year, every, every year SymPy gets a little bit better. So you can actually just take that limit straight out and you get a gain matrix. And once you've done that, you apply this formula, which I, I must stress again, this is not the definition of the RGA. This is just like a way of calculating the RGA given a gain matrix. Uh, but you can recognize the components here because you can see, okay, so the, the numerator here is the gain, right? That, that is, if all the other u's are constant, if I, change, like if I change one of the u's, what will happen to y? That is k. So that's effectively all the numerator elements. We're using the inverse of that gain matrix, uh, the inverse transpose of that gain matrix to supply all these other elements which is what we're saying, and you can go through the textbook to go through the derivation of that, but that's basically all those other elements are the effect of the controllers being uh, working correctly. So how will these things change given that Y is zero effectively? And luckily the calculation is very straightforward and it allows us to apply our heuristics in a much more structured way. Now, keep in mind, these are heuristics. I know that's an uncomfortable sentence uh, because it means that you're, you're going to have to write convincing words rather than doing a calculation, right? This part is repeatable. You just do the calculation, you get the RGA. And the heuristics are approximately like this. If there is an element that is 1, now what that means is this variable has a perfect effect, a good effect on the variable that I'm trying to control, and that effect remains unchanged if the other controllers are in manual. So that's beautiful. That's exactly what we want. So we want to pair on the elements that are as close to one as possible. There are some properties here which makes this RGA almost like there's kind of a Sudoku-like element to this in the, fact, in the sense that all the RGA columns sum to one and all the rows sum to one. And so... If, a, if you have a two by two, you can only calculate one and then all the rest just follow. Obviously, if you've got like a five by five, uh, it's not quite that simple. It can save you one row and one column's worth of calculations. So you can kind of infer the missing element by, by, by knowing that the sums are one. Keep in mind that they can be very much larger than one and they can be very much less than zero. So there's no limit. The RGA, you shouldn't read it like a percentage, right? Like you shouldn't ever think that it's like something that's going between 0 and 1. They can be negative, they can be bigger than 1. If they are negative, and that's the last thing I want to stress, if they are negative, what does that mean? It means that when I switch one of the other controllers, if I just press the button that says auto on that other controller, the gain that this controller sees flips sign. So I did my step test and I got a gain of 1. Now somebody else in a completely different part of the plot, they just turned on their controller. Now my process, the one that I'm tuning here, changes the gain of the process. And the gain changes sign. So what does that mean? It means I used to need a direct acting controller, now I need a reverse acting controller. And not because I've done anything, but because somebody else in a different room did something. That's very bad. I think everybody can understand that if the gain of the process changes sign, most of the time your controller is going to drive the process to instability. So if you have a nice stable controller now, the guy on the other room presses his button, your controller suddenly blows up the plant. This is why almost there should, there is, I cannot ever think of any kind of reason why you would ever pair on a negative RGA element. Right, so you avoid negative RGA elements for all you are worth. But basically you try to get the matchup that is as close to ones that you can. Now we'll speak a little bit about this uh, in some of the later TUT problems as well. Uh, but the key idea here is this tool is a, an addition to the heuristic reasoning that I was speaking about before, right? It is not a replacement. It cannot be used automatically, like completely systematically. You have to think about the time, and you have to still use your brain and try and figure out whether that pairing actually makes sense. So it's not a magic bullet, but it is a very, very useful tool that allows you to break 
like move a little bit quicker than you would by just thinking about it with your brain.